Hi, this is Tom and Debbie Shepard. I want to say hello to everybody. We miss you being at church in person. We look forward to getting back together soon and seeing all of us together in the same sanctuary. Yep, I, I miss in my seat at the front of the church hearing the great chorus singing. I know we can't do the handshakes and the hugs, but uh, hey, Margie, I'm going to give you a virtual hug right now because I miss you. Thanks to everybody doing the online videos, the musicians and the pastors keeping it up so we can stay in touch that way. Again, we look forward to seeing you soon. Stay well. Have a great we'll day. See ya. Good morning, all. Just wanted to let you know how we miss you and how we miss attending church services with you in person. We did go out to dinner last night to celebrate our anniversary, so things are getting a little bit better. Stay safe and keep the faith. We love you guys. Love you, and I wanted to say thank you to everyone for all your prayers and thoughts and cards and, and sympathies for the passing of my father, Ken Underhill. And I, I look forward to when we can actually have a celebration of life service for him. You know, love you and see you all sometime soon. Welcome to Worship with Oakhurst United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Nathan, the associate pastor here. You'll hear also this morning from Pastor Tim, our senior pastor. You'll hear from some of our certified lay ministers and our music leaders. And you've already received a great big hello from some of our congregation members. We want you to know that during this time when we're only offering virtual worship services, that's not the only thing that we're offering on Facebook and YouTube. You'll find Bible studies on Tuesdays and Thursdays covering the Gospel of Matthew. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you'll hear from Stephanie Fergenbaum on those same platforms, a Just for Kids children's chat that covers topics interesting to children in our walk of faith. And Pastor Tim hosts a daily prayer time on Facebook Live at 1130 every day. So please make sure that you tune in for those and look for those offerings. The best way to do that is to subscribe to our YouTube page and to like our Facebook page. 
So if you're watching this on Facebook and have not liked our Facebook page yet, please make sure you do that. And if you're on YouTube watching this, please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any of our great offerings posted on there. We have a lot in store on this special Pentecost Sunday, and we're so glad that you could worship with us. We want you to know that our staff is still here working for you, even though we have some limited hours, and that means that you can contact us by calling the church at 727-391-4769, or you can email us. Speaking of email, please do make sure that you mark your attendance and worship with us today, whenever today is for you. You can email us at the church office. You can sign in by posting a comment on this video on Facebook or YouTube. We do check those. Or you can download our church app on the Google Play Store or the iTunes App Store. It's Oakhurst UMC. You'll see a logo of a tree. Once you've downloaded the app, and that is our preferred method of communication because there's a lot of great things on there, you can click on the second banner on the home page. That is a way to immediately register your attendance. Now, we know that things are starting to open back up in the world uh, with safe social distancing guidelines in place, that a lot of restrictions are being removed, that playgrounds and parks are starting to open up again. And we want you to know that our church has a reopening task force that is taking a look at when it's time to reopen, and they'll discuss that, how we will reopen and what guidelines will be in place to ensure that we provide a safe environment for those who desire to worship with us in person. We plan to continue streaming our worship services at that time for those of you who aren't safe or comfortable or feel secure about joining us in person. But when we do reopen for worship, there will be a lot of consideration given as to how we are able to do that. And we just want you to know that that conversation is ongoing and it is progressing. And uh, so you can look for more information on that in the future, including perhaps a survey that will be sent out that we would love for you to take to give us your own feedback. Well, that's it for the announcements portion of the service. We look forward to hearing from our call to worship by Rick Jacobson. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me in meditation during our call to worship. Eternal God, we rejoice in the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives as we remember today that you sent the Holy Spirit to empower the first apostles waiting in Jerusalem for that promised gift. Give us that same empowerment today on your people assembled in each worship location and on the Church of Christ Universal. Revive the power of the gospel in our hearts that it may be to each of us a personal sacred trust that blesses us in so many ways. Protect, encourage, and bless each of us that in some way we can be faithful to our conviction of believing in the Holy Spirit, the universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Breathe on us breath of God and fill us with life anew that we may love others more fully and live lives that are worthy of your acceptance. Fill us with your light, your life, and love, and joy this day, so that we can be your light, and life, and love, and joy for this needy world. Open our hearts and minds to be receptive to your Holy Spirit this morning through song, prayer, scripture, and the spoken word. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.
My name is Katwana McTire, President and CEO of the Florida United Methodist Children's Home. COVID-19 has, uh, from my perspective, impacted the country in a major way. Everything from uh, social interaction, to uh, how we plan events with our families, to um, how we even worship. We've limited exposure to this campus, to our kids, uh, to our staff. Uh, so those that uh, come on our campus, um, they're screened. Uh, we've stopped the use of volunteers at this time. Uh, so now all of our children attend school virtually all the way to our spiritual life program. We've been able to do it by holding um, outside chapel, being very creative there, um, and by also hosting smaller groups in cottages. We've also seen a downtick in donations uh, during this time. You know, there's uncertainty there um, with regards to the operations of the home, uh, but where there's uh, tremendous clarity is our mission and what we do because what we do can't stop. Um, it has to continue. Our job is to be seed sowers while the children are here. Um, to plant the seeds of love and healing. Um, and I've seen lives changed. Uh, I've seen kids come through our care who are better um, when they leave our care. Um, and that's paramount. Susan is a 17-year-old female um, who's been with us multiple times. Here recently I had an opportunity to speak with her and got to hear from her uh, a bit of excitement, but at the same time um, a bit of apprehensiveness in that uh, didn't know what to expect, um, wanted to be successful. Um, will the home be there for her? Um, I think it was one, one major point that was brought up in our conversation. I have an older daughter uh, who's in her mid-20s, who's, uh, who's gone to college, who's a registered nurse, but right now she needs my support as a father still to this day. Um, that just doesn't stop when our children turns 18. That continues throughout life. And so what gives me hope for Susan is that those conversations can continue they don't stop once she leaves our residential campus. They continue and that support continues much like it does with me and my own children when she goes to independent living or if she's in another program uh, that uh, will open the door for us to continue to support her. And we're only able to do that uh, by the staff that we have and by the donors that support that uh, and the contributions you know, from our church uh, that go to support that. As we continue past COVID-19 um, as a ministry, one of the things that you can always count on us uh, being as a beacon of hope and light for children and families, um, we will continue the path, we will continue to serve, that's not gonna change. Also what gives me hope is that I serve an awesome God. I firmly believe that this ministry has been ordained uh, by him, uh, which is a testament to its longevity, um, and that it'll be here long beyond my tenure here. Uh, but we could not do it without that support of uh, the churches and their congregations. And so thank you. Um, for allowing that to happen and for maintaining that relationship.
to invite you to bow your heads now and pray along silently with me as I offer this morning's pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, on this Sunday in which we observe Pentecost, we are mindful that your Son Jesus gave to us the Holy Spirit to empower us, to teach us, to equip us. Through the Holy Spirit, you give us wonderful spiritual gifts for leadership, for service in your name, and you also uh, equip us with the power that we need inside to rise above the turmoil of the day, to feel peace in the midst of strife, to feel comfort in the midst of uh, distracting and sad news, to feel love in the face of what seems to be an unrelenting evil. Lord, we thank you for the great, great gift of your Holy Spirit that you have poured out. We are mindful, Lord, we remember that your Holy Spirit is what binds us together as one body of Christ. It is your spiritual essence uh, shared between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that unites the Trinity. And it is your spiritual essence that unites us together as a body of Christ here and as a part of the body of Christ in the whole world. So, Lord, we are thankful for your wonderful Holy Spirit this day. Lord, as we pray together this day, we are mindful of the uh, unbelievable situation, the unbelievable evil that stalks our state, our nation, and our world. I'm talking about uh, COVID and the way that it is affecting so much of our daily lives. So Lord, with the help of your Holy Spirit, with the leadership of your Son, and with the grace and the peace that you give to us, we know that we will come out the other side of this valley. We will come back up into the sunshine again. We look forward to that, Lord. We trust in you, even as we put one foot after the other in this dark time. Lord, we pray for our church here at Oakhurst. We pray for the leaders of our church who are trying to figure out the best way forward for us. We lift up to you each other. Lord, we pray in this tough time you would help us to be disciplined, to keep our prayer life going, to keep our Bible study going, to uh, redeem this time so that the virus does not get the best of it, but we get the best of it. Uh, so it doesn't get the best of us, but we get the best of it. And so help us, Lord, to also be faithful in our attendance at worship, in our giving, and in our witness. So, Lord, we uh, offer ourselves to you that we might be uh, truly worthy to be what Paul called us uh, temples of the Holy Spirit, that uh, we might truly be, as you also have called us, a royal priesthood set apart for you to be your light, to be the light, uh, the city on a hill, to be the light that shines in the darkness, to be the hope uh, of nations. And so, Lord, all this is possible through the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. So we pray, Lord, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us to be in us, to fill us, to empower us. Thank you, Lord. We lift all this up to you and pray all of this in the name of your wonderful Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's hear today's scripture reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Hear now these words. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, 
Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Let's join together in prayer at this time. Almighty God, we come before you in this worship setting and we seek to have an experience of your presence to feel your Holy Spirit poured out upon us. Lord, we know, we know that the first disciples who experienced this outpouring of your Holy Spirit could not contain it. They sent signs out into the city through tongues that your kingdom had come for everyone. Help us to be ready and willing and eager to exhibit these signs to the world today. We pray all of this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. While I was growing up in Pittsburgh, I, my family, or my church made annual trips to a Christian camp called Jamonville. It was about an hour and a half outside of the city. I got to enjoy summer camp there during elementary school years, usually taking a friend or my cousin with me. My dad had been a counselor there in his younger years, so our family would make day trips there sometimes. And our churches were usually close enough to, to take either day trips or hold weekend retreats there. I even got to work a few jobs up there at one point, running sound, video, and lighting for events that they were holding. One of these events, Amanda even got to go and work with me while we were in high school. In fact, if there was a real beginning point to Amanda and my relationship where we became mutually interested in one another, it was up on that mountaintop at one particular church retreat. Just before going up there that year, bad weather had rolled through the mountainside and the valleys that made up that part of the region. I remember vividly riding in that year in the van with her family, and it was the second foggiest night I ever recall on top of that mountain. You could barely see the, the rocks that lined the edge of the road, the opening between which would signify to you that you had to turn up this other road that led to the cabins where we would be staying. The second night we were there after a brief shower during the day, our church always held a large campfire where we'd sit around and sing songs. I remember Amanda and I being sent out to gather up the wood that would be used to start that fire, along with a few of our friends and youth group. And every stick we touched, it was either green or wet, but we still gathered them. As we did, I thought to myself, how on earth are we possibly going to get a fire going with this stuff? Well, Bill was the person in charge of the campfire. He and his wife Donna had worked with the youth quite a bit over the years. And he was the one who had commandeered our services to help with running the audio and video at the events at Jamonville. And he was the one who had asked us to collect some wood for burning. We took our found materials from the forest around us to the fire pit where he was eagerly waiting just before dusk. I remember vividly saying to him, Bill, I'm not sure any of this stuff will burn. He looked at me with a smile on his face and with a knowing smirk and said, Oh, it'll burn and there will be more smoke than you've ever seen. I recommend sitting up wind from it. Now, one of the things I should mention about Bill was that a few years prior to this, he had gone out and gotten his pyrotechnics license so that he could run outdoor fireworks shows in Pennsylvania. If anyone could figure out how to make that wet wood burn, it would be Bill. And so later that evening, after dinner, the, the church members gathered around the fire. Amanda, myself, and her grandparents sat safely upwind with her grandfather holding his guitar. And suddenly Bill flicked that lighter on and, and put it to something in the fire pit, and before long, there was a raging fire. Even in the dark, by the light of the campfire, I could tell that Bill was right. There was more smoke than I had ever seen in my life. 
in college, and yeah, it took that long. I'm a little slow on learning some things. But I found out what you probably already know, which is that when wet wood gets lit on fire, there's a lot of smoke. As the water boils into steam in the wood and combines with the smoke particles being produced to make huge plumes. Safely upwind, I could appreciate the combination of fire and water. But those unfortunate souls who sat downwind, they could not appreciate it nearly as much. As it irritated their eyes and their lungs and the coughing started during the singing, it didn't take long uh, for them to get irritated by the smoke. Even for those of us upwind, we could only take so much of that smoke before we had to call it an evening too. Still, I think back and I'm not certain that to this day I have ever seen a bigger campfire and more smoke from such a small amount of wood. I share this with you today because there are a few things that strike me about this Pentecost story. The disciples, this ragtag group of largely religious and cultural outsiders gathered together in this upper room after Jesus' ascension to wait for, well, something to happen. Some of them had been in a room before when Jesus walked through a wall and proved to Thomas that he was the risen Lord. Others had shared a meal with Jesus in a room since his resurrection. All of them remembered being in a room like this one, and maybe it was this one, to celebrate the Last Supper with Jesus before he was led off and crucified. All of this to say, there was a history of some amazing things happening in a room just like this one. Jesus had told them to go back to that room and wait for what he wouldn't say. As I read the story again, I almost get the sense that Jesus would have had a sly, knowing smirk on his face as he told them to go and wait. These disciples, each of whom had abandoned him at the time of his crucifixion, each of whom had fallen away at one point, now regathered in by the words of the risen Lord and the promise of something coming, would have sat there in nervous anticipation for days. The question that I would have wondered if I were Jesus, although Jesus would know the answer is, would they burn? With the Holy Spirit poured out upon them like tongues of fire, would these disciples spark and catch the flame? Or would their faith simply be too damp, too soggy, too wet from their denials, from their doubts, from their desertions? Would fire or water win out? Well, we've read the story and we know that the flames came to settle on them and it seems that almost immediately they sparked. Yet, as happens so often with wet wood as we read the story, we see lots of what we might consider holy smoke rising from them as the Holy Spirit sets to work through their lives. Immediately, they start speaking in foreign tongues so that all the devout Jews who have gathered in the city of Jerusalem can hear them in their own language. The fire has created so much smoke that thousands of people would come to hear them. Some assuming that they're drunk, trying to throw their own water on the fire of the Lord, but really helping the smoke to be seen even more clearly as it provided an opportunity for the message of God's kingdom to spread more broadly among them. I read all of this and I wonder about us sitting in our own rooms today. For each of us today, we can think of our worship time together as sitting in our own upper rooms, and we are waiting. I imagine like the disciples that some of us are waiting a bit more patiently than others. Yet all of us are waiting. Waiting for what exactly? Are we waiting for the world to completely open back up? Are we waiting for the physical building to be cleaned and cleared and the conference to send out word that, that we're ready to go and gather in corporate worship together once again? Is that what we're waiting for today? I don't know about that on this Pentecost. Because as much as I long to gather together with you in worship again, in person, in this sanctuary, what I glean 
from Pentecost is that the kingdom of God would never have spread if the disciples hadn't left the building. They could have spoken all of those languages in that upper room until they were blue in the face. But the fire, the smoke, the flame, the spirit, the message, it would have been trapped in there. It would have suffocated itself. It would have only been them who received it. It was only once the flame got out into the world that the smoke could rise, that the kingdom could grow, that others could see and hear. So I hope as we gather around our screens in virtual worship that we aren't merely waiting for the church building to open so that church can resume. Because church is the people of God. The fire, the smoke, the spirit, The kingdom must always be outside the building. We could have brought our own logs to Jamonville. Some groups did that. It controlled the amount of smoke they made. We could have asked the groundspeople up there to set aside some wood to burn for us later and and keep it dry. Some groups did do that, but we didn't. We trusted that as we were out in the world, that God would give us everything we needed to make a campfire. And even though the wood was wet, If it had been daytime instead of nighttime, that one little fire would have produced so much smoke that the entire mountaintop would have appeared to have caught in fire. The town below would have probably called the fire department and they would have rushed up the hill to put out the forest fire that they imagined was blazing there. Such would be the smoke. I imagine that's what it would have felt like in Jerusalem the fire, the holy smoke that in the Hebrew scriptures always signified the presence of the Lord Almighty among God's people, that it would have looked like it was spreading all over the city from just a few people in that upper room. And the fire had to burn outside the building for that to happen. Just like our witness and our carrying out of the message and our being the church must take place outside of our building for the world to experience it and see it again today. There's something else, too, that stands out to me about this story of Pentecost, though it's seldom mentioned in Pentecost messages. Later on in Acts chapter 2, when we get to verses 40 and 41, Peter has just clarified the gospel message which the disciples were preaching through the power of the Holy Spirit to the crowds gathered from all over. And he concluded his message in verse 40 and verse 41 and shares the results of this fire spreading throughout the city. It says, starting in verse 40, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And verse 41 says, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3000 were added to their number that day. Notice the beginning of verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized. Isn't that interesting? At the beginning of the story of Pentecost, when the disciples poured into the streets and and started witnessing and sharing in many languages, bystanders tried to pour water on the movement and put it out by claiming that they were drunk, which only caused the fire to burn brighter and stronger as it called for the first sermon from Peter to the people of Jerusalem. And now here we are at the end of the testimony of what took place that day, and we have all those who came to repent and believe being baptized or covered in holy water and marked out as new followers of Jesus. Everywhere we look in this scripture, we can see the effects of fire and water, meeting, merging, moving together. And I think this is really fascinating. The disciples, pretty freshly off betraying Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit and are moved out into the world to witness to his kingdom. And they burn all the brighter and all the bigger because of their recent experiences and the holy smoke of God's presence once again fills the city. And all of these new believers who repent and want to become followers of Christ and have caught the sparks and are coming alive like burning embers, they get baptized first. They get some water applied. It's almost as if Fire and water work together to make a bigger, more noticeable display of God's presence and God's kingdom at work among us. It's almost as if 
the wood needs to be at least a little wet so that when it catches fire, others will sit up and take notice. And this seems today interesting for us. I've had people tell me it feels like someone has thrown a wet blanket over their life or over their faith during this time. Others have described this season of life to me as if they were living in a different part of the world in the rainy season where they weren't able to leave their house and everything just seemed dark and dreary. I approached Pentecost today with these words in the back of my mind and I wondered if maybe, just maybe, this isn't the point. Wet logs burn longer, burn brighter, and produce more smoke. And we see that it has been true pretty universally, always and everywhere, that the church going through adversity is a church whose witness is strengthened and streamlined and more potent. So we come to the celebration of the anniversary of Pentecost, and we can't gather together in our own upper room in one place in this sanctuary today, but each of us is gathered in our own personal upper room. We gather together on this anniversary of the receiving of the Holy Spirit in tongues of fire by disciples who had been nearly waterlogged in their faith. And we celebrate the birth of the church as the body of Christ in Jerusalem and the Holy Smoke and the fire of the Spirit that spread in those first days. And we come to it as a church experiencing our own drenching, our own sogginess, our own rainy days. We come to this day when we are waiting around in our own upper rooms and we come to this screen and we are waiting for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're waiting for our opportunity not to go and worship together again, though that would be nice, but to be able to move into the world and witness through the fresh outpouring of this Spirit about God's kingdom and about God's goodness. We're waiting to be able to spread the holy smoke of God's kingdom throughout this land. It won't happen without the fire of the Holy Spirit with us, and it won't happen without the waters of adversity and baptism that are covering us. We need both the fire and the water in order to make a mark and to mark the sign of God's presence, enduring presence in the midst of all things. We need both the fire and the water to show the world the realness the closeness, the witness, the witness of God's kingdom in our lives. We need both the fire and the water to sustain us throughout the days and nights ahead, throughout the journey of faith. We need both the fire and the water of that first Pentecost to mark our lives. It's this we've waited for and longed for and persevered for and it's this that we trust and we hope for. May we receive both and respond to both in our lives today and every day. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the fire, the tongues of fire, the Holy Spirit that poured out upon your first disciples at Pentecost. And we desire to receive a fresh outpouring of your spirit in our lives once again. Lord, even though it's difficult, we thank you for the adversity we face. We thank you for the waters of baptism that mark us as your own. Lord, help us when we are freed from these upper rooms to go out into the world, to be faithful witnesses, to spread your presence and your word everywhere so that others might see the signs of your kingdom all around. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, good morning, everyone. It is time once again for our weekly tithes, gifts, and offerings. Separated here and not able to put money into the plate on Sunday morning, we have to resort to other means, and our church has three different means that we can give our offerings. Uh, we can use the uh, old-fashioned method of writing a check to the church and putting it in the mail. Um, if you're watching this, you probably already know what our address is. But just in case, we are at uh, 13400 Park Boulevard in Seminole, Florida, and that's 33776. We also have a wonderful church app that's available through the App Store. If you haven't gotten that yet, you really ought to do that. It's really a cool and convenient thing, and you can use that to give your weekly offering. That's what Anna and I do, and we find that to be the easiest and the best way. And you can also, however, go to our uh, church website, and uh, there is a, a link that you can click on to give from the church website, and you can do that by putting in your credit card information, that kind of stuff. So. Anyway, having mentioned all that, uh, it's time to offer up our tithes, gifts, and offerings to God. It's an important part of our worship because, as Jesus said, where our treasures are, there our, our hearts are also. And so our giving not just helps the church and the ministry and the mission of Christ, but it also helps soften and convert our hearts. So uh, if you would, bow your heads and let's join together in a, a prayer blessing on the offering. Let us pray. Lord God, we each benefit so richly from your hand just through being alive on this beautiful planet that you have given to us. We each benefit each moment of the day. We could never thank you enough, Lord, for all that you do if we thank you every day, all day. So Lord, in our thankfulness, to you for all that you do for us in our desire to make a difference for the mission and the ministry of Christ in our church here, in our community and around the world, and in our desire to be faithful and to have our hearts shaped by you. We offer to you these tithes, gifts, and offerings this day. We pray that you receive them and guide them to these great purposes for the sake of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, in his name we pray. Amen. Receive the benediction. Almighty God, 
pour out your spirit upon your people once again, that we might be ambassadors and witnesses for you, that others who encounter us might truly see the presence of your kingdom among us. We ask all of this as we prepare to go from this service today in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before you go, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share this video across all of your social media platforms. Thank you for joining us in worship. We'll see you next time.